so I've I've really I've really got, you know, got nothing really planned. So it's, it's all ad lib from now, and you guys can can drive what what we're doing. Um, but there was a slight mention of of looking at some Python programming in QGIS, which some nods and some interest. But uh, if later on this today this morning anyone wants to come and say, Barry, can you really talk about something else that I might have mentioned in my first talk or anything else? I do a lot of um, uh, making maps in R as well. It's just that I know the other guys are covering all that stuff. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about using things like Knitter to write reports or using ggplot to do graphics. Uh, I mean, yesterday while Edza was talking about space-time stuff, I was busy trying to get the contest data into a form that I could make nice plots with ggplot stuff. So uh, I can talk about that, and you can work on your own stuff and just stick your hand up if you want to uh, a hand trying to, trying to do something. But let's see. Um, so let's load up QGIS. Has everyone got that far? Has everyone got an installation who needs it? On, Olivia's got it on her air computer. Um, right, so who's, who's run it before? Who's used it before and, and loaded some data and stuff? Okay, because I'm, you know, baby steps. We're going to go through this very slowly. Um, the, the project concept in QGIS is saves kind of your work and, and QGIS has it looks. So all the layout is saved with a project and the project will compose a number of layers of various types. Now people do tend to get a bit lost. The first thing they look for is a file menu and then maybe they look under the project menu to try and find a load and then maybe they think open is going to load in their data or something. Um, that's not going to work for them. Uh, let's, we could try and get you some data first of all. It's another option. If you go to is the text all big enough for you to read up there? So the bar isn't big enough there, but big fit. Yeah, that's me. Um, so all the stuff I've done for Geostat is in this GitHub repository. I can clear out that. Just as a, such a URLs are disappearing. You, you guys all know this that. Um, Firefox want to remove the URL from the top because it confuses people. And no one knows what HTTPS anymore is. You're on the web. You're on the web page. Why do you need to know where you are? Yeah, quite probably. Um, The easiest way will be to uh, there should be a downloady zip thing somewhere. Oh heck. Dub dub dub. That's what the Australians say, isn't it, Tom? The Instead of www, it's dub dub dub. Hmm? Yeah, is that what your wife says when she says www? They, go, they just go dub 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 dot. Well, in, instead of saying www dot Google, they say dub 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 dot Google. Woo woo woo. Sounds great. Um, yeah, diddly diddly diddly. 
Um, Yes, uh, that. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if I should try and mess with the resolution just so you've got a bit more, but I'll probably break it. Let's just try. This is like painfully 1980s. Is that better? Yeah, but there's more text up there now. So GitHub is this website where you can upload just about anything, as long as it's public, for free, or you can pay for a private repository, and lots of projects develop their code there. So GitHub is the site, slash Barry Rollingson is me, and slash Geostat is a repository all this stuff. If you make an R package, is it smart to put it on GitHub or better to use R for it? What would you recommend? All the cool kids are using GitHub. But they don't, you know, they don't check, they don't, like on R for it, they compile a package, they check it. So no, there's no, there's no build. Um, but you're going to run that yourself anyway, one hopes. The only thing the big thing you get from our forge is it will build Windows binaries for you. No. Um, but. Uh, but they used to have a Mac, Mac uh, two, two times developer in Linux and the staple Linux and Linux. Yep. And 32 bit computers for this, so they had lots of machines. Sure. That works. Right? That works cross-platform. And the other thing, I think it works cross-platform. Right. And the other thing is that uh, our forge also does work still. It's very unreliable. So if, if it works, it works. It doesn't work. It might not work in the moment. So our our forge is just this guys in Vienna, right? It's small tool. But then you could say that Cran was just these guys in Vienna. in Vienna or. Oxford. Yeah. yeah um, we gave up on GitHub, by the way. I was looking at it, and, yeah. and we just went for our forge. Oh, OK. I just so thought. The uh, uh, more important idea is whether you do Git or whether you search. Well, that's, a, that's a fight, isn't it? I mean. Um, There's a search string there. I mean, people will tell you that there are packages on GitHub and then tell you how to, to get it. What I'm, what I'm desperately trying to find now is the, the button that lets you download the whole thing as a zip file. Oh, there we go, download zip. <laughs> ah, right. So, if you, right. So if you go to that repository, the thing about um, using Git, which is a system for controlling your software development, is it allows you to make branches. So you're working on your your code, and then you suddenly think, well, actually, what about if I change the method for inverting this matrix? You don't want to um, sort of develop that in your mainline code and then discover it doesn't work as well as it did, and then you've got to jump backwards. Because you might be trying to fix other things in your code as well. While you're changing the matrix method, you might discover there's a bug in your plot code. So you've now got a string of a sequence of development which is, has got intertwined changes to two different components of the code. And backtracking some without backtracking the others is tricky. So what you would typically do is go, okay, I'm going to keep this main line of development, but I'm going to branch it, and I'm going to work on this new matrix code. But if I find any bugs in the plotting, I'll fix them in the main line. So you'll be fixing bugs in this line and adding the new method in this branch. And if you're happy that the new method is good, then you merge the branches. So you can get, often a, an individual developer will work on their own branch. So you get multiple 
branches of code which then get kind of reconciled. Getting a bit away from QGIS and stuff now, but it's, it's all good, it's good stuff. Um, so there's a master branch here and a GitHub pages branch. And it, if you go to that GitHub pages branch, because that's what I'm using to make the web pages, you'll see it suddenly jumps and there's all this content. And then if you hit the download zip, it'll give you a zip file which you can use your operating system's preferred way of working to download. And because I live on the command line, I can unzip it like that. Hmm? Hmm? I live there. I live in the, in the terminal. It's great. You can go anywhere. But if I, uh, <laughs> if you're going to heckle from the back, you can you can go. Are there any other rooms in the hotel tonight? Because you know I might want to have another room. See, look, if, if I live here, you see, because if I want to get a drink, I just go to the pub. And now I'm in the pub. I don't go anywhere. Eh? It's a bit empty at the moment. Let me make some friends. There we go. Got some friends now. <laughs> I go to the pub with my girlfriend. Okay, so now you've, you've got, or I've got here, all that stuff from the web. And there is a data folder. So you can be browsing this on your usual Windows Explorer stuff. And... Uh, I'll be happily command lining. And so that's, there are some shape files there. So let's load some of those in. We know we're loading shape files. We have to know that this is vector data and not raster data, even though there's various other types of layers we can add. So this dialog again often confuses people who just want to load a shape file. They have to know that they're loading a file and not a from a directory or a database or a protocol. So I, I'm not, I really think this needs cleaning up in the QGIS space, but I think the developers aren't happy about it because they like this dialogue. It seems quite uh, advanced to them. So you have to make sure you're loading a file and then you hit browse and then let's go to my download, that zip file, data, England, and we'll load England Ordnance Survey. So there's quite a few sort of OK buttons and things to click there. But eventually, I get a map of uh, English, English counties and London, various other bits. And it picks a random color to shade the, uh, shade the polygons. Um, no, I think there, there's a range of random colors. I don't think it's, you never seem to get horribly garish colors. And the other thing that it's done is it's set the projection in the coordinate system. Now, who was it? Was it um, Robert spent an hour of his session talking about projections? Yeah. Um, QGIS has good support for that. If you want, there is a, a project reference system and each layer obviously will have its own projection system and it can switch between them dynamically. So if I change the projection system, uh, which is... Uh, yes, right. So the project system, if I change it to 4326, which is your standard latitude, longitude, GPS coordinates, WGS84 datum, etc. And I hit that. And I make sure that on the fly. Um, okay, so now England is slightly squashed because it's square latitude, longitude. Um, and it's changed the coordinate system. And now if you read off the 
coordinates down here, you're getting latitude longitude. So I can zoom in and stuff. And I live about there. Right. Um, so what can we do with this? Let's just change the colors around a bit. So to change the styling, you can right click on the layer here and go to the properties. And uh, what? So there are some preset styles there. So now I've got. Uh, that's just spots. So this is just using a single symbol renderer. So each thing is just categorized by a single identical symbol. Um, if I want to change it by a category, I can just use uh, a, a categorical variable. I don't have any categorical variables in here, but if they were uh, like land use categories or something. The graduated renderer lets you choose a column, say an area, and a color scheme, uh, different ways of classifying it. Uh, let's see if that gives us nice numbers. Yeah. And you can choose a whole bunch of color schemes or make your own up. And there's the regions colored by area. And you can label them. So we want to label this with the area name. And it's got a pretty smart labeling algorithm which tries hard not to crash things into each other. So I'm going to set the projection back to the standard UK grid references, because they look good. So with dust breaks, can you move them around? Um, ooh, there may be some manual adjustment. I'm not sure. But certainly if I zoom out, it'll stop kind of labeling some of the things. It just reduces the number of labels. I think Hereford and War is a limit on the field length. <laughs> it should be Hereford and Worcester. <laughs> and then we can click on them and get the data out. Devonshire. Who calls it Devonshire? The, the, the more shires here than in Lord of the Rings. We don't have this many shires. So you can see how it's kind of changing the Norfolkshire. <laughs> That's ridiculous. No one calls it Norfolkshire. It's London. Greater London. Uh. Okay, so that's all, uh, all in the layer properties. The attribute table gives you a spreadsheet view of the data without any of the geometry. So you can uh, look through it that way. And you can sort the table by any of the variables. Um, and you can do selection on expression. So I should be able to say this, the expression engine in QGIS is quite powerful. You can do all sorts of clever things. So if I look for area greater than some number, and hit select. That seems to be selecting far more than I thought it would, but if those units are. Ah, okay. This is the. That is not the. That is a variable within the. Within the file. Whereas this is actually computing the area in the units of the of the geometry. So these, these things with a dollar on are actually um, computing the area in the units, in real geographic units, whereas this is just a probably the area in um, quite a small number. Um, in square meters, I think. Uh, 
think. I mean, it must be related to the that column, that area column. But I can select on records, so I can uh, fields and values. So in quotes, area greater than one, greater than oh, point two. Let's make sure we get something. Okay, so that's sort of standard sp spreadsheet selection stuff. But it also selects them on the map and highlights them in yellow as well. Uh, and you can play around with the selection in here. Now, if you if you want to change any of this, you can edit. Let's let's change some of these shires, make them less ridiculous. The little pencil is the edit button, the edit toggle. Um, what's the most ridiculous shire down here? Devonshire. That's just Devon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tyne and Weir. Ne? Nee. No. Nope. Uh, most of us, right. <coughs> okay, and then when you switch the editing off, you can then save the changes. So that's updated the shape file now. And I will clear the selection. Well, I can. And that's back to the, the shading. Uh, okay, do we want to add another layer or add something else? Um, the really useful thing that I use in nearly everything in QGIS is the Open Layers plugin. So you head to the plugin manager. The search box is very useful, and it's even more useful now there are 100 plugins or so. So this filter will help you search for things. So search for open layers and then you click to load that plugin and install it. Um, hmm? Rivers. Um, if you've got a data set of rivers, now then there may be a way of getting that from OpenStreetMap data. Uh, or you'd go and find a the natural earth Data. That that's a nice uh, source of data. I mean, I don't know how much people need to go searching for data. Let's just sidetrack on this a second. Yeah, the the plugins can be written in, in um, C plus plus, in which case they need to be compiled for your platform and then loaded. But because of the Python engine inside QGIS, people have just started writing Python plugins and it's exploded and there are hundreds of them. And some of them are very specialist. Uh, I mean, that's a specifically Korean map layers plugin. I mean, I don't, I'm never going to use that. Oh, I might do. If you go to help, yep. you just do F1. Yeah. Yeah, does it crash? <laughs> does nothing happen? I don't know. Uh huh. Is it happening? Yay. Whoa. Uh huh. I wonder if that's fixed. Yeah. Um, 2.4 is coming out real soon now. So hopefully, a few of these glitches will be fixed. And the other thing is, I, I have my, I installed QGIS, but it's all in Dutch. Yeah. Uh, how, would it, how would it switch? <laughs> what, switch to English? Yeah. Um, ooh, good question. Uh, I mean, it could be getting it from your environment. Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, I don't... Go to the options dialog. Preference, option, long. Hmm. Ah, I find it under extra. Extra. <laughs> where? Do you have extra? Yeah. Extra where? I've got extra, but... Ah, yeah. settings. 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 Options. Options. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Locale. Override system locale. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Croatian, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Except I wouldn't be able to understand Croatian. <laughs> Why not? You well, you know, yeah, Croatia, you don't, I mean, nobody uses Croatian uh, huh. operating system. Kind of thing. So you don't really, when they translate something to Croatian, you don't know what they're talking about. You know, in English, but you don't know in Croatian. They invent some words. Yeah, the, the how's that actually changed the menus? Maybe I don't have the French language settings. Uh, hmm. Oh, enabling changing override uh, requires that place restart. So you have to stop and start again. So, um, but yeah, they're, they're very thorough with their translations. They're very keen on getting good translations out in QGIS as well. Because a lot of the developers are well, hardly any of them are English. Most of them are, there's a lot of Germans, I think, working on it. A lot of the hacks and hack fests and coding things, code sprints are in Germany, uh, in Central Europe. Um, yeah, right. Oh, I was going to, yeah, so the Open Layers plugin is nice because it gives you a, a context. So we load an OpenStreetMap layer. And one of the things it has to do, it's going to load in image tiles for OpenStreetMap. So it has to reproject it to the Google uh, Web Mercator type thing. And it always seems to have a slight problem updating, and it puts it on top. So I'm just going to rearrange the order there, bring it behind, and now I've got my county layer on top. I can just toggle that to get that background layer, or I can use uh, this is going to look a bit messy. This is not particularly good, good looking cartography. If I increase the, not the labels, but the style, just transparency up a bit. And now I can see through. The other thing, the other thing that um, came out in QGIS 2.2 is different blending modes. Now, if you ever played with images in Photoshop or GIMP or something, and you've got different layers of image, you can. there are different ways of compositing them. Because transparency, if you just increase the transparency, you sort of lose, you stop being able to see the thing on top, and you just see through, straight through to the thing underneath. Um, the other blending modes can kind of in keep that, um, Keep the contrast between the layers. I'll just see if this does anything useful. It, it works particularly well for black and white. I need to just up and decrease the transparency. So this is actually going to sort of multiply the pixels together. So I get that. That's not. There's no transparency there. Okay. This layer is completely opaque in terms of transparency. The the county layers. Hmm? That's it. Um, you add, you go to the Open Layers plugin and then add OpenStreetMap layer. You can add uh, Google satellite layers as well. And
Um, right, what else can we do? Yeah, so a lot of this stuff is actually written in, in Python anyway. And all the processing tools, a lot of these are written in Python. I wonder if the Saga... Who was teaching Saga yesterday? What can we do with some polygons, Tom? Should I get some centroids? Should I try the Saga centroid thing? If I've got... Okay, I've not, I've not used these plugins before, so let's just see. No, okay. I don't have the... I think I don't have Saga installed. Uh, I thought I tried that. Um, I can show the installation cost. Well, Windows is uh, all package. Mm-hmm. So is it working for you? Have you got the Saga GIS working in QGIS? Yeah. OK, that's cool. I've got Python Saga GIS binding, so I must be missing something important. Or maybe Saga is. Oh, Saga is installed there. Hmm. Maybe there's something that they need setting up. Well, that box is ticked. Activate is ticked. That one doesn't look important. Doesn't look like it should break it. Okay. But somehow you should be able to get all these things to work. Let's just try again. Okay, the processing toolbox is in the processing menu. If you've got, you got that at the top. Yep, great. Okay, so the Saga GIS stuff isn't installed, but that's uh, there should be a Centroid algorithm in the sort of default QGIS tools. Actually, I'm going to use the search filter again. So Centroid, there's. That's the Saga one. <laughs> Centroid. I'm surprised anything matches. OK, so there's a polygon Centroid algorithm there. Take my counties, save it to a temporary file. And just uh, hit the Run button. So now I've got a set of points in a lovely green color. Just turn them into airports. If you've got data for the major cities. Yeah. Uh, one of the other useful things I like is if you if you zoomed in, accidentally, there's a, a zoom back button, so you can just go backwards and forwards between zooms. If you get lost, um, <coughs> and obviously zoom to the extent your data. Okay, we've got some points. We've got some polygons. Uh, trying to think what else we could do. Right. Um, let's make a bit of space. Get the toolbox out of the way. Right now, you'll notice that there's a misalignment has occurred. And that my OpenStreetMap data is not lining up with my stuff. Now, I, I think this has been reported. If you just kind of get the map to refresh itself, just drag it slightly, it will, it will um, sort itself out. But if sometimes you play around with the user interface, things seem to get out of line. So, um, I'm sure that's 
bugs being reported. Which? Purple lines, these ones. What do you want to do? You don't like these C boundaries. Well, yeah, if you want to do custom cartography, you can. Well, that's. I mean, this is all open street map data, so if you've got a decent enough um, cluster to do the rendering, you can create a style file and render it however you like. So this is what these guys have done. Um, no, you do it with a thing called Mapnik. So this is getting very complicated now. The open street map raw data So who knows about OpenStreetMap? Who's contributed to OpenStreetMap? Who's edited? Yeah. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, OK, so OpenStreetMap, for those who don't know, it's like Wikipedia for the world. Um, sorry? Yeah, that was the airport. That was Aberdeen. Um, so this is where I live, and if I suddenly discover that the pub on the corner is closed, I can delete it, and the change will get will go through to the, the map pretty quick. My favorite coffee shop can be added. Um, and you know, this is all being done by contributors for nothing. Now, when this project started, people had mapping parties and they got groups together and they would wander around with their handheld GPS units because it was before iPhones. It's only been going, what, 10 years, I think? Sorry, was there? Well, they have this brilliant editor, which... If I could remember my OpenStreetMap username, I could show you. Um, it's the problem with password remembering on browsers is that you get to rely. No, that's a big red, big red no. Um, there's a really easy sort of editor. I, it's a similar kind of thing in uh, in QGIS. Okay, if I go to QGIS, just get rid of some of the clutter. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And now if I enable editing on the on this layer, all the vertices on each of the polygons have now become editable. And I get a an editing menu somewhere. So I can add features, I can move features. If I decide that um, this county should actually be over there, I can drag it around. If I want to get rid of London, I can destroy London, yeah? And if I want to move individual, I can actually. Uh, what does that do? No tool, right? So if I if we change the border of London, I can actually take this corner here, and let's just oh, did I miss it. So I can, or I can probably select several vertices and shift them. I'm now create a big hole in in between London and Hertfordshire. Um, so I could create a new county if I wanted. Uh, keeping the sort of topology correct is always tricky with shapefiles, but yeah, you can edit these things and then save them and update the shapefile. And there's a similar kind of vertex editor thing for OpenStreetMap. Yep. So that I could credit it based on my username or something and just get the layers. Yeah. But I have to wait, right? It takes some time until they validate the vectors because it's not immediately. I, 
don't know. Let's see. Possibly. I think the only option you've got here is to download by an area. So that won't... Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Because the, the OpenStreetMap database is so huge, it's probably sharded on several hundred servers or something. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a like an XML-y thing. This just has kind of selection by area. So if I zoom into a small area, I should be able to download data from Map Canvas area. Done that. There's a complicated step. You got to ah, convert the uh, the OpenStreetMap XML to a database format. And uh, it's it's a faff. Um, I think there's a plugin to do it easier. Uh, where was I? OpenStreetMap. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once you get the editor going, you just see the the thin, you know, the road center lines and the polygon outlines for editing. Much easier. Um, but yeah, Olivia's question about she didn't like the maps. Then you can basically download the, all the vector data for OpenStreetMap and then or even just for a region, and then run Mapnik with a particular set of styles and stuff. These, this Stamen company have got um, almost a monopoly on nice open street map styles. So they also do this sort of pretty watercolor thing. Yeah? Oh. I mean, how are you... When you say export, a QGIS, a map from QGIS? Yeah, exactly, a map from QGIS. So it looks very nice in the, in the, in the window. Yeah. In the flat window, but if you, if you export that map, uh, let's say you go to the um, map composer, mm -hmm. and you try to export it, especially with the um, damage on the map, it turns out that you really blur the QGIS. And, and I tried to... Because I was working with that, Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't have a, an answer for why this is like that. And there seems to be other people on the internet that say the same thing. Is it blurred or just low resolution? It's a very lo low resolution, which causes yeah. the image to be blurred. It's interpolated. Just the same pixels, probably. Oh, well, I'll play with that sometime. Um, well, it's it's tricky because each of the well, that's what you're doing. You're making a PDF. The the tiles are kind of at a low resolution. If you want to do a high, you can't get a high resolution version of exactly these tiles. You can, you could try getting the, the more zoomed in tiles to create an image with a high resolution, but then all the text would be tiny. So they're not really designed for print, are they? That's, that's the thing, they're not designed for print. Um, what you really want for that is, a, is, a, is to be able to, to recreate their styles for your area in a high resolution using their style sheets and, and the raw data. But you could. Yeah. Uh, right. 
Okay, let's let's um let's try something. I have to remember how to do all this now. Gosh. So this is the Python console. And um glad we went to <laughs> pay them loads of money to make high resolution tiles for you. So what you get when you fire up the Python console in QGIS is a Python prompt. And it, the only little clue you've got is this help I face. Ooh, and it's Python help. And it has a whole load of things about this I face. So I face is it's a QGIS interface object. So this is a, a Python thing. And this is your key from the console to the rest of the application. And that gives you a whole zillion load of things that you can eventually derive. So that iFace object represents the running application, and you can get things from it like the map canvas and the layers and stuff. Um, so in order to get the layers from the map canvas, uh, in the help a bit better. This is where I end up looking at code to see how I, how I did it last time. Um, right, okay, this is where I look at a website on QGIS Python. There's a lot of good tutorials out there. Um, This is probably going to do exactly what I was going to do. You've got this iFace object. Okay, so here's one, for example. They're actually kind of going through there. Let's just copy it and paste that. I always thought I'd get that as you can. Can just back. So iFace dot active layer. Now that's, if you type it without the brackets, in R, you normally get the code for the function. Yep. Um, Python tells you this is a method of active layer. That's basically telling you it's a function you need to call. So if we call it with an empty thing, we get back an object, which is a vector layer. So let's just call that uh, layer. And the name of that layer, again, sometimes the Python things are attributes, and sometimes they're functions. So I, I will often just type that and go, oh, rats, I forgot it's a function. So I need to call it. So this particular layer that I've got now here is has a name of output layer because it's this layer of points there. So that's the layer. <laughs> And of course, the layer itself has a whole bunch of methods listed here for that. So I can do perhaps something like that. And that's changed the layer name now to centroids over there. Or whatever you want to call it, new airports. Um, and from there you can get the geometries, you can get the features, and then the features you can get the geometries, and so on. So the features are got by, uh, okay, so yeah, we can do something like layer.feature count, 46 features, 46 of those, those points. Um, get features. Yeah. Features. Um, 
So now I've got a feature iterator, which is one of these clever Python things that gives you another feature every time you call it. Um, so I can actually, I can persuade it to feed me back all the features by getting Python to sort of list over them. So now that's a Python list of all the features. The first one starts at zero, so that's now a feature object. So we've gone from the interface object to a layer to uh, a list of features to an individual feature. And so if I just, for convenience, put that in another object, what can we do with a feature? Um, get its geometry, and what can we do with the geometry? We can modify it, and so on and so forth. Now obviously doing it, doing anything you want to do with these things, kind of line by line on the console is awkward, so there's always the option of uh, opening a file. So features are simple features? Uh, yeah, if I'm understanding what a simple feature is. It's a, a row and a shape file. I don't think I really understand the how full. Much more hmm? That's much more, I was thinking how do you see features? Is it, is, is the model that you shape files? Oh, no, no. It, it would be a row in the shape file for this case. I, I don't think I quite understand enough about the simple feature standard. Is. But it can be like geometry collection, which shape files are not. Possibly. I don't know. A, simple, a, a single simple feature can be quite complex, is that the, it can, it can be points and polygons, yeah, if it's a feature collection. Point. Yeah, multi-point stuff, yeah. I mean, these things are rare, aren't they? I mean, you... Well, uh, yeah, um, but that that can be just folded down into a, a set of single points. I mean, uh, the the kind of application I've, I've thought of for multi-point data is where you've got a start and an end, and you don't really you've got you know two points for every feature. Your feature is start finish, and it's not really a line. Maybe I don't know. Mm. Oh, semantics. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's nicely lined up. So the, that geometry object, let's just bung that in. So let's see what this is. What can we do with the geometry? An oh, mm -hmm. uh, export to. Is that going to give us right? So that's the uh, WKT representation of that geometry, and the coordinates there are in um, the UK grid references, I think, because this is derived from the polygon, so it's kept the same coordinate system. We should be able to get the coordinate system from the layer. Anybody see a coordinate system? Oh, is it a spatial reference system? The problem is there is so much kind of baggage that these things carry from various other things. And the naming, sometimes it's, you, you get this, sometimes you don't get that, you just give it the name and stuff, so. Um, I may have to refer to the documentation. Sometimes you can just see it, but there's an awful lot here. Um, or it's in the metadata or something. Um, in the official QGIS documentation, was that it? Yeah. 
you're kind of into the developer documents now, so possibly here. <coughs> In raw Python. If you want to write the centroid algorithm yourself, or if you. No, for sure there's a polygon of the centroid. Yeah. Um, well, that's what we did with the processing toolbox. Now, if I think, if I go back to that, the processing toolbox. But can you do that in Python also? Um, yeah, uh, and the, the processing toolbox will tell me how. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. So I think if I, nah. Okay, that might not be written in. I'd have to dig that out. I can't, well, let's see if I can. Uh, the geometry, I think, is a separate issue. Is that just going to return us the centroid? Okay, returns the center of mass of a geometry. So. Let's try that uh, with those vector features. Where's my Python console gone? Right, so I want to get the polygon layers now. We'll see if we can. Uh, I don't want the active layer. I want to get a different layer. So. Layers? Is that going to give me a list of layers? No. Okay. Um, well, let's change the active layer. Let's be lazy. So we take this set of uh, polygons. Let's just zoom into them. Right. Okay, so that's the, um, that layer of polygons, we can get that, and we can get the features from that layer, and we can get the first, get the list of all the features, and I can do F uh, square zero, so take that first feature, geometry, Centroid. Okay, it doesn't show me what the coordinates are, but I can just do export to WKT. So that's the centroid of that feature. And if I want to loop over that, I can just do something like. Uh, ah. Mm -hmm. I can do a, a, a Python list thing for G in uh, actually I want G in a list of features yeah so G is my list of looping over my list of features which is list of features F right so those are all the centroids exported as WKT so you can see the numbers uh, that. So have you got to just have a table? Like I get to make an object, which is just a table. It says X, Y. Um, yeah, yeah, that you'd get the, you'd have to get the coordinate from the, those WKT geometries. So there's probably a method. Let's just get a geometry. What have I got? Let's do F0, F0.geometry. You can round them at some point. Yeah. Okay, well, what I'm... What I'm going to try and just do now, if I've got the centroid, that's a geometry object. I know it's a point. Can I just get the x and y coordinate out? 
Um, I, there's there's multipoint and multipolygon here, Edza, so maybe that answers your simple features question. Um, I can never see how. What, where, what, who? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Um, Okay, so that's uh, a tuple of x, y coordinate. Yeah. Um, although it seems to have done it as, as um, it seems to have rounded it ever so slightly, which is odd. Okay, it's just in the presentation, I think, right. So if I wanted to get a matrix of all those things, if I take, instead of exporting to that, I just do those as point. So that's now a 2 by n matrix. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? With, with some Python code. <laughs> okay, I've just got numbers now. I mean, I've gone from, I've gone from a, an entire cross-platform Windows, Linux, Mac application, which was this this iFace thing. Right, so that... It's just not printed it as a table. It's a two-dimensional... It's a two-dimensional structure. I, I don't expect to read it. Okay. Now, she's right because features is a um, an iterator. If you've got a huge shape file with millions of features and they're all very huge and complicated, you don't want to grab all those into memory. So, QGIS uses iterators. And if you wanted to work on a single feature at a time, then. Um, you can just write a Python loop, and it will, as it iterates over the, this features object, it will grab each one without having to grab them all. Because I kind of want to show you them all in one go, I can do this. But I can, because this is iterating, right, so that's iterating over a list of features that have already been loaded. I can actually just iterate over the features, and I get nothing back because I've already iterated over the features. So once the iterator has gone over once, it needs to be reset or re-grabbed from there. So this will do that again. Um, in that case, it's done as WKT, but I'll just show that. So what's this going to do? It's going to do nothing because I've already I just iterated over the features once. So that iterator was exhausted. Reinitialize it from the layer, and now I can get. Well, that's that's the. It's a compact representation. Well, you could turn those coordinates into points, and map them. No, but but I, I don't think that's it's not really an issue. You, you're not going to get anything from even from from a, that presented as a two by one, a two by. Well, I can I can import the graphics and, and plot them as a, you know, I can I can I can do if I've got map plot, you know, now I've got a, a graphics package that I can draw charts and box plots and things if you want. Yep. You can do that just from...
It's a slightly different problem with this, this raster blurring. That's Well, you haven't got the vector data, so. Save what as a file? Yeah. Those are the centroids of my. Yeah, could do that. Yeah. Could do the Python in R. Um, you can do this kind of thing in R, yeah, using the S. Yeah, you can do that with the S. You can do all this with the SP package on a shape file. Okay. Um, the reason that you that you would use the Python console is if you were, were trying to make it nice for someone who knows how to use QGIS. Okay. Here's a nice easy pa mapping package, right? You can't zoom in like this in R. Well, I don't know Rob's some of Rob's stuff for the raster package is quite nice, but you know this is a nice user friendly. It's word for spatial data, okay? So it's, yep, it, anyone can, can drive QGIS. It doesn't require any. So you write the Python code and then you add it to the Yeah, you make your own plugins. So if you've got um, some spatial, so if you've got some spatial statistics thing, if I've got some spatial statistics algorithm that I've written in Python, I could write it to you know, do a clustering on these, on these coordinates. Now, what I'm doing with this, this console is just using it for experimenting and exploring the structure of the application to see how I go from the layers to the features to the actual X and Y coordinates. Well, it, yeah, I mean, eventually the command line will disappear because I'll have written a nice plug-in with some menus or some processing things, and then it all becomes point and click on this processing menu. No, you don't have to rewrite the GUI. You, um, yeah, there are, there are, Okay, the, when you write a plugin, so all these plugins, when you write a plugin, what happens is QGIS loads your plugin code and feeds your plugin one of these, uh, the iFace. And there are methods on this iFace for adding menu entries, putting messages on the message bar, adding things to the map canvas, adding a completely new menu here and there. How do you make sensible menus? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, ah, that kind of menu. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yep, I've seen that done. Uh, many years ago, a guy in um, the New York Natural History Museum developed an application for just people to take photographs. I mean, it, it's, it seems trivial now, but this was you know, 10 years ago. He was probably working on this on an old version of QGIS. Being able to load in a photograph, geotag it, and then show it on the map on QGIS and save it as a metadata on the image and strip out all the other stuff you don't need. So, yeah. <laughs> That's that seems. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure if I if I loaded in all these plugins, it would just look horrendous, you know. So I um. But the user interface is is sophisticated enough that you can kind of hide things and get rid of things. Um, I'm trying to find something that I know will will bring up a nice new menu. Uh, wow. 
there's, every time I look, there's like several new things. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, so this is buffer by percentage. Now this it's nearly coffee time. So let's just take these off. Oh, group photo. Um, I mean, I think a, 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 a plugin can can, yeah, do anything. You you can get, you can just get uh, an entry in the plugin menu, but you can also add new top level menus. The the plugin documentation is pretty pretty thorough. Uh, And you also, because the user interface uses a thing called Qt or Qt, there is a an editor for for designing user interfaces. I'm not sure if I've got it. Oh, I have. Oh, maybe I haven't. Oh, why not? Yeah. Um, If you want to design a complicated user interface, the Qt designer, which looks like, say, this one, so this is a, wor a work in progress where someone is creating a, a dialog box that looks like this, and this is outside of QGIS. This is a, a separate project that QGIS just uses the, the GUI for. You can drag the widgets that you want onto here and change the layout and change how it behaves when you stretch it. And then what you get from that is a, an interface description file, which you can then wire into Python. So if someone hits the clear button, it runs a Python function that does something. If you hit the preview button here, it calls a Python function that you've written, which knows what to do when someone's hit that preview. If you add something to this list, you get an action, and the Python kind of hears it. You don't have to write a load of code to generate these dialogues. And these things can be as complicated as you like. And that they are used in the QGIS dialogues anyway. So if I um, go to the properties dialog, which is quite horribly complicated, this has all been designed using that same Qt designer. Uh, in this case, they're using C++ code. But it's um, the principle is the same with Python. You could write a dialog that was this complicated, but every time you change something like this, your Python code runs. Oh yeah, I could. Yeah, um, what there is over here, if I just clear out that, one of the processing toolbox things is R scripts. Oh, okay. So, for example, if I go here and look at um, summary statistics, I can actually edit this script and. These comments at the start are saying what the inputs are. So it's a layer and a field. So it could be these polygons and the area. And then it does some thinking and it outputs the summary, this summary statistics. So that's just some means and medians and whatever. It's just creating a data frame. Now, if I run it, I get a user interface based on those comments at the start. So I'm going to just get the summary statistics for the area. If I run that, if it doesn't disappear, then I think it's firing up R. It's converting the shapefile layers into something. And it's crashing my poor little laptop. Oh, there we go. And there's the output. So that's done by R. And you, and you can send things the other way as well. So you can create spatial data frame objects in R. And they'll appear, I think, as layers, new layers back in there. Graphics. 
image and things. Yeah, I think there is. There's a, there, are, I think there are plugins for doing that, like this this one that this geo-referencing images that he was. Uh, uh, Evis, I think, it's event visualization tool. Yeah, view images associated with vector features. So you can have a, a feature like a point with or a polygon or something with a an image associated. Uh, there is there is image analysis as well in the classification plugins for remote sensing images. The time manager was something I was going to try and play with because it lets you. Um, if you've got an attribute on the, on a data set that represents time, you can drag and drag it to view data within a window, the same as on the time thing on Google Earth, which is quite nice. It's coffee time. Talking of time, it's it's coffee and photograph time. So, group photograph. Where are we going for this, Tom? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to 